Guten Abend, dear all. A warm welcome for the, to the second lecture celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Museum Folkwang in Essen. I'm very pleased that you joined us and also that a few of, the, of you follow us live on YouTube. Before I introduce Sylvie Patry, I would like to say a few words about the Jubilee series. Everything turns around the year 1922. 1922 wasn't only the year that the Folkwang collection came to Essen. It was also a year of change in the visual arts. The first lecture of the series last month about the Parisian gallerist Paul Durand Ruel, who died in 1922, showed us his crucial importance for the Impressionist painters. Today's lectures will be about Lise Réau, muse, muse and partner of Auguste Renoir, of whom maybe one of the most famous portrait hangs in our collection. The next lecture in April will be about the Japanese poet, doctor and art critic Mori Ogai and his reception of European modernism and especially of Auguste Rodin in Japan. Later this year, you will be able to follow lectures on Marcel Proust and Jacques Kerouac's drawings. The first one died in 1922, while the second was born in 1922. Marcel Proust's work had a great influence on literature and art. Jacques Kerouac, who influenced an entire post-war generation with On the Road, can be seen as an antagonist of Marcel Proust. Another lecture will be will show us the work of the American artist Grace Hartigan, companion of Helen Frankenthaler, and one of the very few women in the group of abstract expressionists around Jackson Pollock. There will be also a reading of works of lyrical expressionism from the 1920s. All those that I have cited shaped in a way or another the emergence of the Museum Folkwang. And that is how I move on to today's lecture. The portrait of Lise Tréau, Lise Femme à l'Ombrelle, was painted in 1867 by the French painter Auguste Renoir. It belongs to the very core of our collection and was bought by Karl Ernst Osthaus in 1901. In May 1901, Karl Ernst writes to his wife Gertrude, Today with Van der Velde in the Secession, a Renoir, fabulous, 1800 marks, lady with parasol in the forest, museum piece worth three times as much. And the next day, but now I'm 80,000 marks lighter. What do you say to that? The Renoir is so incredibly beautiful that I couldn't resist. The painting costed Ostos a lot, more than he usually paid for works of art. But he knew that by buying this portrait, he would draw all the attention on the collection and the museum he was building up. And it worked. Art critics noticed it and even wondered how such a beautiful painting could have been acquired by a collector living far west, far away from any German cultural metropole like Berlin, Munich, or Hamburg in the middle of a coal and mining region. Sylvie Patry, our speaker for tonight, is general curator. She is director of conservation and collection at the Musée d'Orsay since July 2017. Previously, she was deputy director and chief curator of collections, exhibitions, publication and archives at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. This international experience followed 10 years at the Musée d'Orsay as curator, then chief curator. Before that, she worked for curatorial missions at the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art in Paris, the Musée Gustave Moreau also in Paris, and the Palais des Beaux-Arts in Lille. Sylvie Patry is a specialist in the painting of the second half of the 19th century, and more particularly in Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. I won't list you all of her impressive exhibitions. I will just tell you that she curated and co-curated the Berthe Morisot retrospective in 2018 at the Musée d'Orsay, as well as the exhibition about Renoir, father and son. In 2014, the exhibition about Paul Durand Ruel at the Musée du Luxembourg. In 2010, the fabulous exhibition about Claude Monet at the Gallery Nationale du Grand Palais in Paris. In 2007, the first exhibition in France dedicated to Ferdinand Hodler. Dear Sylvie, 
Thank you for being here, and we're very eager to hear your lecture. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I apologize for not being able to deliver this lecture in German. I mean, I studied German for four years, but I'm not able to speak it. So I will try to speak in English. And I would like to begin to by thanking the museum, his director, the team, and especially Mathilde for her assistance. Um, it's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be taking part in this centenary. As you know, the Essen Museum is a kind of myth uh, among uh, uh, experts on 19th and early 20th centuries, so I'm very pleased to be here. To celebrate this anniversary, we have de decided to, with Mathilde, to focus, uh, to devote this lecture to one of uh, the masterpiece of your collection, Liz, and one of my favorite paintings by Renoir. So what I would like to do tonight is to provide a, ki a kind of anatomy of the painting, which is at the same time clear yet mysterious, simple yet complex, and I would like to embark you on a search for its heroine, its model. So just to start, in 1868, Pierre-Auguste Renoir exhibited a large format painting, which is simply entitled Lise. It depicts a young woman in full length, outside, on the edge of a forest or in a clearing. It is summer, the young woman is in full sunlight, but the maj majestic oak trees behind her create what appears to be a refreshing patch of shade. She is standing in full frontal pose, but her face is in the shadow of a parasol. And the fa her face is turned to the left in three-quarter profile. So we can't really see her face very well. Lise, Pierre-Auguste Renoir was 26 years old when he painted this work. He was born in 1841 in Limoges, which is a city in the center of France, but his family settled in Paris uh, around uh, 1845. So basically, he grew up in Paris. Renoir's origins were very humble. His father was a tailor, and his mother was seamstress. At the age of 13, he began to earn a living as a porcelain painter. Throughout the 1850s, sorry, he decorated place plates, vases, fans, and blinds. Few traces remain of them, but they had a, last, a lasting impact on his art. And uh, this is what we are trying to show at the Orangerie currently for, uh, in an exhibition entitled The Impressionist Decor, which I co-curated and I'm delighted to advertise here. Um, so to go back to Lise, in 1862, at the age of 21, Renoir was admitted to the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris. In the early 1860s, he was also attending the private studio of the painter Charles Glair, and in, in this studio he met Sisley, Pissarro. He also made in these years the acquaintance of Monet, Cézanne, and Frédéric Basile. So these early 60s were really decisive years for many reasons. Renoir revised his aspirations, and he began to move in new circles. First, he made the transition from the world of workers and artisan to uh, an artisan activity to the world of artists and fine arts. Second, probably a year later, in 1863, but certainly in 1864, Renoir publicly declared his ambitions as a painter with a work which he subsequently destroyed. He took part in the Salon. The Salon, so this is his early pictures and the meeting with Basile. The Salon was an official event held annually in Paris at the Palais des Champs-Élysées, a building which was demolished in 1900. 
uh, and it's replaced now for those who know Paris well by the Petit Palais. At the Salon, it was something like almost uh, 5,000 paintings and sculptures uh, which were selected uh, by a jury with conservative taste and they were exhibited for a couple of months. Many works were rejected and these rejections led Renoir and his soon-to-be um, impressionist friends to exhibit independently in the 1870s. So this was the birth of impressionism, but we will speak later on about this later. At the Salon, paintings were hung almost touching each other in, alphab in alphabetical orders uh, by painters' names. So no really artistic choice in the presentation as you can see here in these images. But the Salon was hugely, immensely popular. It was a public event. Several hundred thousands of visitor, uh, visitors would attend the Salon. It was also a rendezvous in the high society calendar. And the world press in France and even in Europe and in the United States would discuss the Salon. Museums, collectors, art dealers such as Durand Ruel purchased works at the Salon. In short, the Salon was a crucial milestone in an artist's career. Having work accepted and being seen and noticed was absolutely critical for an artist. Renoir's submissions in 1864, a painting which has been destroyed, and in 1865, a portrait of Cisle's father, and another painting we don't we know nothing about it. This is uh, the Cisle's father, the father portrait. So these two paintings did not attract any attention. In 1866, a painting which meant a lot to Renoir was rejected. It may be this painting, this one, alors pardon, je passe, the one uh, you see in this uh, atelier scene by his good friend at the time, Frédéric Basile. Frédéric Basile was a wonderful painter who died um, during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. So this is a painting we believed um, Renoir submitted in 1866 and he destroyed later on. And we think, but I will come back later on this, that the models were Lise. Um, in, 1870, in 1867, sorry, Renoir submitted another large painting, Diana, the entrance, which was also rejected. So this was a backdrop to the creation of our painting, Lise. Executed in the summer of 1867, Lise was submitted to the Salon jury in 1868. The painting was not only accepted, but also attracted attention. It was this picture, therefore, which actually marked Renoir's public debut in Paris. It was his first hit, his first success. Lise was also the first work to truly, truly sorry, reveal his ambition of renewing the painting of his day. Lise marked the beginning of a new phase of Renoir's art, which would pave the way for Impressionism. In uh, unpublished notes dating from approximately 1880, Renoir remembers Lise as, I'm quoting Renoir, an example of the new painting which made a terrific effect at the Salon in 1868, end of quote. But although Renoir never denied the significance of this work, by contrast, he actually kept part of his its history, which refers to a crucial chapter in his life, a secret. This is what we are going to discover tonight. The model of Lise, the model of this painting is Lise Tréau. Lise Tréau was featured for the first time in an article on Renoir by a Renoir expert named Douglas Cooper in the late 1950s. But her significance in Renoir's life was overlooked for many years. Lise role, true role, was not acknowledged until the 2000s, so quite recently, 20 years, something like 20 years ago, which is very fresh, I mean, for uh, research on one of the most uh, famous impressionist artists. Yet Renoir is said to have carved their initials into the tree trunk, 
But I can't, I mean, uh, so I went to see the painting in, in the flesh, but I mean, uh, you see letters on the trunk, but I can't really decipher the initials, but the tradition says that it's written uh, an A and an L uh, to um, record their relationship for eternity. Uh, what what we can say is that Liz remained unknown for many, many years. She was born in 1848 in Ecquevilly, Normandy, but her family moved to Paris in the mid-1850s, where her father was a cafe owner in Paris. Liz had a sister, Clémence, who was five years older, and Renoir painted her portrait by in 1860, oh sorry, this is not the right image I wanted, bon, pardon. And Renoir painted a portrait of Clémence, we will see it uh, later on. Uh, Clémence uh, was the mistress of Renoir's friend, the painter and former architect Jules Lecoeur. Lise and Renoir probably met through Lecoeur and Clémence, possibly in Marlotte in the Fontainebleau forest, where Jules Lecoeur rented a house in the summer of 1865. If the meeting did indeed take place in this way, then the Essen portrait is with the forest in the background is really a nod to the start of their relationship. The house in Marlotte became a gathering place and the group enjoyed a very bohemian lifestyle there. In 1868, the very year in which Renoir exhibited Lise at the Salon, the two Treo sisters fell pregnant. Neither was married, and so to hide their condition, they had to move to Ville d'Avray, um, a city which in the Paris region, which is better known for having uh, been elected by Corot as uh, his living place. On the same day and in the same place, Clémence and Lise gave birth to children. Clémence gave birth to a daughter, Françoise, and Lise to a son, Pierre. So Pierre, who was illegitimate, was Renoir's first child, which was discovered 20 years ago. We think he died almost immediately, like it was quite often the case in the 19th century. Two years later, in Paris in 1870, Lise gave birth to a daughter, Jeanne, whose existence was only revealed in 2002 by Jean-Claude Gélineau. In 2007, it was in a catalog, in an exhibition catalog in a, for Sao Paulo in South America, so it was not well, you know, the information was not well spread at the time. Then in 2007, he wrote a book about this discovery entitled Jeanne Tréau, Pierre-Auguste Renoir's secret daughter. The illegitimate, illegit, illegitimate uh, baby was abandoned by... Uh, voilà, here is the Lecoeur family. The illegitimate baby was abandoned and it was, she was placed, Jeanne was placed with a wet nurse in Normandy. And uh, the way Jean-Claude Gélineau made his discovery because he found, by chance, unpublished letters exchanged by Renoir and his secret, secret daughter in the possession of descendants of the wet nurse. So really, you know, um, something that you never usually discover. And Lise and Pierre-Auguste probably ended their relationship in 1872. This following year, Lise met the architect Georges Brière de Lille and she married him 10 years later. We don't really know how she lived. We just know that she had this kind of middle class life in Paris or in France. However, uh, and on the contrary to Lise, Renoir stayed in touch with his daughter, with, ja with Jeanne, and he helped her, even though he really he never mentioned her, except to a very, very small number of close friends and relatives. His wife, for instance, Aline, he married in 1890 with Aline. His wife, Aline, remained unaware of the existence of this secret daughter to whom he made regular payments. Jeanne lived simply in Normandy and never traded, traded on her origins. I mean, she never claimed to be Renoir's daughter. She knew it, but she never claimed it. Even when her father became one of the fr friends most famous and expensive painters, 
And even when her two half-brothers, Pierre Renoir and Jean Renoir, the film uh, director, made names for themselves on the French stage and in the film industry. Jeanne died in 1934. We know very little today about the relationship between Renoir and Lise. They probably never actually lived together in the 1860s, early 70s. We do not know how she earned a living at the time. And what we know is that Lise destroyed all letters dating from this period. So we have no trace, no archives. However, we do know now that Liz was the first mother, I mean the mother of Renoir's first children, and given the importance of children in Renoir's life and in, Rose, in Renoir's oeuvre, I mean this is quite important. And what we do know is that Liz was very much part of Renoir's paintings from the mid-1860s until 1872. We can recognize her in, some, in more than 20 paintings by Renoir, sometimes 23 or 27, it all depends. So uh, this is uh, the image I wanted to show you at this time here. So you have an example of you know, the many, many paintings where you can recognize Lise. This situation was by no means unique. At this time, Camille Doncieux, for instance, was Monet's partner, and later she became his first wife, but she was also the artist's favorite model. You can see her, for instance, three times on this picture, um, which was painting almost at the same time than Lise in 1866. The fact that the mistress and the companion uh, of the painters uh, were uh, models can be explained in financial terms because professional models were quite expensive. It also reflects this young painter's desire to move away from stereotypes and to renew the canons of female beauty. Their aim was to paint real, living young women of their time, not professional models striking conventional poses. They contrasted the ideal of beauty derived from antiquity with the woman of their day. And this was acknowledged by the writer, Emile Zola, who was familiar with uh, Monet, Renoir, uh, artistic circles through his friendship with Cézanne. And um, when he wrote an article about the Salon, the 1868 Salon, he mentioned Lise. And he said that it's very um, intriguing when you know the situation, that the Renoir's family situation, private life, was not public at the time. So what he, what he wrote um, is really uh, shows uh, that he knew about the situation. Zola uh, said, Lise looks like the sister of Claude Monet's Camille. This is one of our women, or rather our mistresses, painted with great realism and a pleasing pursuit of the modern aspect. So Lise was featured in all uh, the paintings shown at the Salon by Renoir in the late 1860s, which is really important as you have understood that the Salon was really key to uh, an artistic career. This reveals also the significant place she occupied in, a, in his work. Model, models played a key role in Renoir's creative process. Without a model, there is no painting, was uh, uh, Renoir used to say. He liked to um, familiarize, familiarize himself with his model, and I'm quoting Ambroise Vollard, his friend and dealers, when his brush was fully accustomed to a model, it was a nuisance, it was a difficulty for him to change her. Lise played, and, and of quote, Lise played a variety of roles in his work. It is just striking to see how she fostered the experiments during this period which led Renoir in, in very different directions. She was painted So she was painted in natural delight, alone as, or as part of a couple in outdoor paintings which fluctuate between genre scenes, 
courtship scenes or unfantasy figures, as you can see in these three marvelous pictures. And also here, one of the masterpieces of the Berlin collection. This is the engaged couple. She's um, posing with Alfred Sisley, the, the soon-to-be impressionist painter and Renoir's friend at the time. But you can see also that Lise uh, is able to um, be an elegant, fashionable young woman, like in this uh, picture, which is uh, uh, conserved in Basel. The woman with a seagull hat. Here, like in Lise, Renoir expresses his particular taste for extravagant hats. Hats decorated with feathers, and even here with whole dead creatures, started to, be, to make an appearance from the 1870s, so a bit later. Uh, and this, uh, in this portrait, I mean, he's, um, it, it's, it's really an expression of his fantasy, of his imagination. It's not really a reflection of the fashion. It's, it, it will be, these kind of hats will be fashionable in, later on. This emphasis on elegance can be seen in the interior domestic scene featuring Lise at the woman with bird in 1870, which is here at the Guggenheim. And in a very different vein altogether, Lise inspired also Renoir to produce nudes and orientalist fantasies. So I don't think that I don't think that Liz uh, posed for this uh, entrance, entrance, but she, uh, she's really, um, uh, she's clearly the model of the realistic nymph in the painting of the National Gallery in London, kind of companion piece to the sens sensual and extraordinary odalisque uh, from the National Gallery in Art of Art in Washington that you can see below and here uh, on a more large, on a larger scale. And you can also see Liz here at the Beigneuse uh, au Griffon, which is a, a, a tribute to the tradition, to the, um, to the antique uh, sculpture, but also a tribute to Courbet. Current, concurrently with these large paintings, which were an attempt on Renoir's part to establish his, creden his credentials as a painter of importance belonging to this new generation, Lise featured in more modest sketches in which she is depicted outside, and I think that these sketches offer an interesting insight into the Essen masterpiece. So this is the, the, the one you, you have on view currently with the show, and you see all these very small sketches. And this series, it's quite uh, interesting because she she's wearing a, um, a dress which is comparable to the Essen, uh, to the one she's wearing in the Essen portrait, but a bit different. Oops, sorry. Lise reveals to great effect one of the key ambitions of this new generation of, of painters born in the 1840s, who became known later on as the Impressionist. This ambition is, and I'm quoting Bert Morisot, uh, who was very much part of this group, placing a figure uh, in the open air outside. It's something she wrote in 1869. Outdoor painting was a normal practice for artists, especially from the late 18th century. Textbooks suggested painters should work outside on outdoor subjects. However, this practice was viewed as an exercise, as a form of training, in this context, artists mainly painted landscapes on small supports, which were very easy to transport. And often, if you look at these kind of sketches made in open air, it's often on cardboard because it's much easier to bring with you uh, than the uh, canvas. And these kind of sketches would never, left the would never leave the studio. It was for the painter's uh, uh, sake and for the painter's interest. Lee's offers a degree of continuity with this practice, yet also uh, the painting breaks with this tradition. Continuity on the one hand, as this painting was produced in a studio in Paris. The little studies with, uh, which I've shown you were sort of dry runs, and the large 
painting uh, at Essen uh, was inspired by a smaller study painted in the summer of 1867, so in Chantilly or in Fontainebleau, two forests close to Paris. We don't really know well, so I'm sorry because it's not the... Voilà. So this is Bert Morizo about placing a figure in the outdoor. Um, so um, Fontainebleau uh, had been frequented, frequented by painters and photographers since the, since the early 19th century. The forest became a true artistic laboratory and a kind of open-air studio. From the 1830s, then this interest gained ground to such an extent that artists such as Théodore Rousseau, Constant Royon, or Diaz de la Pena, of whom Renoir was a keen admirer, and he knew that Diaz de la Pena, were referred, referred to as the Barbizon School. Barbizon was a nearby village where the painter took lodgings. So the Barbizon School was characterized by landscapes which aspired to realism, but they also represented nature and the, forêt, uh, and the forest of, and of Fontainebleau as timeless and unspoiled by modernity and industry. Renoir, when he was young, began working in Fontainebleau in the early 1860s. He went there with painters such as Sisley and also Monet. So the depiction of a forest in the background of Lise refers to this tradition of the Fontainebleau and the Barbizon school. So I mentioned continuity and it's also, it's also continuity because it was painted done in the studio, not uh, on the spot. I mentioned continuity, but also this is a break with convention, as Renoir innovated in at least two ways with Lise. First, he used a large format for, for his, this portrait, a strategy he adopted very early in his career and which artists have been using for a long time. The size of a work can help to attract attention. You see now it, it, the salon walls were packed with pictures, so the larger you, the work is, the most um, uh, attention you may uh, gain for, from the public and from the critique. Renoir was pursuing the ambition of a new generation of artists, and I'm quoting Renoir. The dream that all painters have is placing a life-size figure in nature. Lise was also contemporaneous with Monet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe. You can see here. So it was uh, started by Monet in 1865, and it was then uh, um, eventually abandoned by Monet. Monet wanted to present friends meeting in the open air in Fontainebleau. On the scale of a history painting, the initial, the initial painting measured almost six meters large. But Monet never finished it. What you see is two fragments that Monet saved in the 1880s. In 1868, another painter uh, had the same ambition, the very year of Lee's success. Frédéric Bazy exhibited a family portrait at the Salon and it, it was reflecting a similar ambition. So the question of the format is really important when you look at Lee's. Renoir used standard of the shelf canvases for the large formats to which he had already become accustomed, the largest being 195 centimeters by 130 centimeters. However, here with Lee's, with uh, 184 centimeter, centi centimeters by 114 centimeters. This is no longer the case. This is a bespoke canvas. It was really made tailored for Renoir. It, it's not a standard canvas. And this type of format represented a real investment and a financial risk for, for an impoverished artist like Renoir at the time. Canvas and paints were expensive, which was why artists sometimes scraped canvases to remove paintings which they didn't like anymore, and they painted over them. This, is also, this also explains why they left works with color merchants in lieu of payment. And this is the reasons why in the 19th century, 
before the art market exploded and became professional. Sellers of art supplies were also picture dealers because they had pictures given by the artist in, in lieu of payment for uh, paintings for uh, paintings and canvases. The risk for Renoir was not only economic, it was also a technical challenge. In the case of the budding impressionists, there was a dual, dual challenge, a double challenge of transcribing plein air effects onto large formats. So you, have the, you, have to deal with, you had to deal with large formats, but you had also to deal with this uh, ambition of you know, having these plein air effects. As a novelist, Duranti wrote in 1876, so two years after the first Impressionist group exhibition in 1874, it involved coming out the studio. Monet, for instance, did for this work, dug a ditch in his garden to work outside on Woman in the Garden. But we know that he started in plein air, but like Renoir with Lise, he mostly painted in the studio. What mattered for the artists of this generation was to create the impression of the outdoors and of sunshine with its effects of flickering light and shade. They were preceded by masters whom they admired, and in particular by British 18th century portrait painters such as Gainsborough and Reynolds, who depicted their model as if they were standing outside. But as you can see here, and it's not only because my uh, images are not of very good quality, uh, Reynolds' figure, and this is not a criticism to the paint of the painting, looks uh, as if it is posed in front of a landscape. The figure is not integrated in the landscape. It's just the landscape look, uh, seems to be a kind of, you know, a decor, of a, the, uh, a decor, a decoration. In Reynolds' in Reynold's work, the light, which, as it is the case with Renoir, comes from the left of the painting, the light looks more dramatic and theatrical than natural. The world painting by the, the fledging impressionist is not the same as that recreated by the painter in the stable light in his north-facing studio. The impressionist world, or the soon-to-be impressionist world, is a changing world, fluctuating to the rhythm of nature, but also to the rhythm of modern life. And this is also what Liz is about, about this issues and new subject matters of modern life, leisure, and fashion. As we have observed, the same is in a forest, either Fontainebleau or Chantilly near Paris. With the expansion of the railway network in the late 1840s, excursions to the country, day trips for city dwellers living in crowded metropolis, were very much in fashion. And you see a plate uh, from, you know, an engraving, uh, which, test which testify, which, which illustrate, uh, which illustrates this, uh, this vogue, this fashion. Relationships with nature and the body changed. Medical textbooks recommended walking as a form of, of exercise and outdoor leisure pursuits in the fresh air. This is also what you can see in this wonderful photograph by uh, Baldus. However, women continued to protect their pale skin with parasols. Only peasant women working outdoors had bronze skin. Suntans were associated with the lower social classes until the 20th century. This is why Liz is having his where he's holding a parasol in this picture. The theme of women outdoors, of women walking uh, outdoors, became one of the impressionists' favorite subject matters, as we can see, for instance, in example in this masterpiece from uh, the Musée d'Orsay, Monet's Poppies. To keep pace with these new leisure activities, 
Fashion developed new gowns and lighter summer fabrics, such as muslin, that you can see uh, in Lee's uh, picture. Dresses of this type, which came from Great Britain, became wide, widespread in 1862-1863, so Lee's was very much uh, at the edge of the new fashion. These dresses, as you can, and I'm showing you uh, other examples, were looser and less constricting than the dresses in vogue of the time. As you can see here, for instance, they were also simpler, uh, like ordinary working dresses, with less layering of fabrics and fewer frills running in all directions. At a time when women's fashions still restricted movement, this kind of dress, uh, which were called robe de promenade, walking in dress, dresses for uh, walking outdoors, they were one of the few acceptable outfits in which the body, the female body, was slightly freer Although women continued to wear corsets at the time, and the waist was still clearly highlighted, and in the case of Lise, it is accentuated by Renoir by the contrast between the white uh, gown and the black belt. And I sh I'm showing you other examples. The light created by this very fine, gauzy fabric also corresponded to middle-class ex expectations of women. The fashion for white muslin in the 1860s reflected the moral values expected of respectable women, purity, cleanliness, and distinction. This type of dress could only be worn by a well-off woman who did not work. We know that Liz was not exactly a respectable woman, as we've seen. By giving this painting the simple title Liz, just, just as Monet did with one of his own paintings he exhibited under the simple title Camille. This is also what Renoir highlights. I mean, he, she's, she's, um, she has a very respectable dress, but the, the simple title of Lise, I mean, highlights the, con the contradiction between um, what he wants to show and what she is really. A painter would never give the first name of a portrait of a middle class or aristocratic woman. Such paintings were often exhibiting at the Salon at portrait of Madame de X, Madame de R, etc. So you would never give the, the first name of the model. Renoir broke the rules. He painted a large canvas following the conventions of the grand, of the grand genre, of the, genre, the, the history genre and the grand uh, portrait of a young woman from a modest background and one of his partners in the bohemian lifestyle he was leading at the time. Renoir was not painting a portrait so much as the life of his contemporaries. The emphasis on the dress is part of his agenda. It situates the painting in the here and now. It also refers to fashion plates which depicted women outside in summer gowns. Fashion magazines with illustrated plays were beginning to develop in the 19th century, which witnessed the birth of couture, of fashion industry, and also department stores. All these images, and I'm showing you some examples behind, all these images were very much in the public consciousness. Renoir blurs boundaries here on many levels. He blurs boundaries between portraiture and genre scene. He blurs boundaries between social classes, but he also blurs boundaries between history painting or Beaux-Arts painting and more popular images between high-low and low-bro low cultures, if you want. Furthermore, the motif of the muslin dress in Lise, this is a, the work, uh, the picture, uh, Camille, which was exhibited under the title Camille, and it was a huge success. Uh, and it's in Bremen, of course, not Bremer. Um, furthermore, this motif of the muslin dress offered Renoir the opportunity to showcase his virtuosity, notably in capturing both opacity and transparency. This is something I, I was looking at this afternoon in the, in the galleries. I mean, it's just fascinating the way, I mean, there is this contrast between transparency around the neck uh, with the sleeves and then opacity. I mean, it's really absolutely stunning. 
all of the future impressionists played on what an American painter close to the group described in 1863 as a symphony in white. And I think that in many respects, Renoir's Lys is a form of response to this painting by Whistler, Symphony uh, in White, which caused a great scandal in Paris in 1863. We often think, when we think scandals in 1863, we generally think at uh, uh, Lunch on the Grass by Edouard Manet, but I mean, actually, uh, this picture by Whistler was also, also uh, a cause of scandal. Echoing Renoir, Whistler's model was also his mistress. The painting is a large format, like Lee's, and the eye is drawn to the virtuosity of the depiction of the white dress, and the fact that the white is not actually white, but a mixture of colors, shades, and reflections. And this is even truer in the case of Lee's, who represents the theme of the white girl. I mean, this is the other title of this painting by Whistler. But with Renoir, it is transposed outside in order to experiment fully with this new approach to painting, this new impressionist approach to painting and color. So at the conclusion, I would say that Lise, with all its mysteries, ambiguities, and richness, is not just a major work by the young Renoir, but also a key impressionist milestone. Almost 10 years later, and then again 20 years old, Monet appeared to pay a kind of tribute to Renoir with his young woman with parasols, still in white, but delicate and even more fragmented in the, in the brush strokes and vibrant brush uh, work. So Lys entered the history of Impressionism through, I mean, by its quality, of course, but also through its first owner in 1873, Théodore Duret, which you can, whom you can see here on this image. Théodore Duret was also the first historian of Impressionism. He wrote a book in 1878, so barely four years after the first Impressionist exhibition in Paris in 1874, so the history was just beginning, uh, and the painters were really in, in the midst of their career. But nevertheless, he wrote a book named The Impressionist Painters, and Lise by Renoir was the only illustration of the book. Sorry for the quality, but it, uh, it, it's uh, from the Bibliothèque Nationale. So this is the only painting which illustrated this very, very important pioneer uh, book on Impressionism. And thus, sec it secures its pride of place in the history of French painting and French Impressionism. Then the painting passed into the hands of the major Impressionist Paul durand ruel who sold it to another major uh, dealer, Cassirer, and as it was said before, in 1901, it was exhibited at the uh, Berlin Secession. Lise, at that time, became woman with a parasol, which effaced the model's identity. But I think it's more important to underline that it's purchased in 1901 by Karl Ernst Osthaus at the exhibition marked its entry into not only the history of Impressionism, but the history of modern art. Thank you very much.
thank you. I think that there is still a lot to say about Liz, but I mean, it's really, I hope that uh, I've, I was able to demonstrate how central it was for Renoir, for the 1860s, for the, the, the history of Impressionism, but also, as you said, I mean, that it takes, it took place into a very um, profound social and artistic context. I mean, so it's uh, interesting to... Um, painter, they just borrowed these pieces and and to paint these uh, your, their models in these looks, or could she afford such a dress? Yes, this I mean this is a very good question. We don't really know. What we know is that, for instance, that this uh, the this dress was uh, rented by Monet. Uh, uh, I think it was rented by Basile, who was more wealthy than money, and then uh, money used it. But I don't know for Liz. But I mean, this is, a, yes, it, it should be investigated, but because it, it's, it was really quite expensive at the time. But it also the time when um, you, can, uh, you can find, I mean, uh, so generally, I mean, the, the, the dresses were made by, I mean, tailors like uh, Renoir's father, but it also the, it's also the beginning of department stores. So we know for some dresses which were depicted by Renoir later in his career, in the mid-1880s, for instance, we know some, that at least one dress was really coming from a department store because, because we were able to find uh, uh, the, 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 the models in, in one of uh, uh, the largest uh, Parisian department stores of the time. But for Lisa, I don't know. But I would, I would, I would like to know. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. I have this question because I was uh, like trying to imagine how a situation of uh, modeling and painting took place. Is there some kind of information left on the, uh, let's say, the social interaction between the model and the painter. So was there a kind of a degree of decision making that was maybe like bound together or was it like very hierarchical uh, situation? I mean, this is hard to tell. I mean, in this case, I think that there is really a complicity between Renoir and Liz and she, I mean, it was very much part of her life to model for her lover, and I don't think that there is, a, you know, something a kind of hierarchy, and that it were all, that it was imposed on her. And I mean, especially because, as I mentioned, I mean, it was the same for uh, Camille Doncieux, uh, who was uh, modeling for Monet. It was also the same with Sisley. I mean, he was not married yet. It was the same for Cézanne. So she was not completely isolated in this situation. I mean, with Renoir, they were from the same social background. What became a bit more complex, especially for us today, is, for instance, with uh, Camille Doncieux, because she was quite from a, she was from a humble background, but Monet was from a much more bourgeois background, and he was not only hiding her from her family, from his family, but he was also, at, the, at some time, he was also hiding their child. And then he, they married, and then he publicly acknowledged the fact that he had two children. So I think that it was, I mean, they were both, I mean, the, the couple was, you know, on the same page, and that Lise and Renoir was, uh, were in agreement. Um, but um, uh, otherwise, I mean, it was really, uh, uh, I mean, it was a, it, it was a, uh, a job, I mean, and, and you know that there was a, a market for models in Paris, uh, it was in uh, the Pigalle, and uh, every morning, uh, models, female or male, would stay, there is still a fontaine, I don't know if you know this place in Paris, and they would stay, they would stay, and painters, because this was the neighborhood in Paris where uh, many, many painters or sculptors were living at the time, at the end of the 19th century, and they would come and they would pick a model. 
So, and there is really, a, it's, it's really a financial trade. And we know that uh, many models in Paris at the time were from Italy, were immigrants from Italy. So there is really a, you know, a social, very strong social relationships. But I don't think in this case with Renoir, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Um, you were, I think, hinting on that uh, uh, Lise was a working girl herself. Do you, do you know anything about her profession? I read several various things. Do you know details? No, I mean, uh, not, not as far as I know. I mean, we, 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 we know, I mean, that she was from a quite modest background, but we don't know how she was, uh, you know, earning her life when she was posing for Renoir. Then when she got married with this architect, I think that she never had to work. I mean, she was a kind of middle class woman. But uh, in the 1860s, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if Renoir was making enough money just to live with her, uh, to live, even if we don't think that they uh, really actually lived together because at the time we knew, we know that Renoir was living by Basile and then he was living by France because he had no money to rent an apartment or a studio. Uh, so he was sharing uh, as we as we do, <laughs> as students do now in, in, in everywhere in Europe. Uh, but regarding Liz, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we will make some discoveries, but I don't know. And we don't know about her sister, either, Clémence. Um, Liz only modeled it for Renoir. Alors, we think that she modeled for Basie. I'm going to try to find the... I mean, this is something which has been written by some uh, Basie expert, but I mean, I'm not completely convinced. But she, she may have modeled... Pardon, huh? I hope it's not... It's not too tiring for the eyes. Voilà. Uh, so this, is there a light or something? No? Oh, mince, pardon. Est-ce que je suis? Oh, zut. <laughs> I hope it's not registered because <laughs> it's a failure. Um, so, voilà, encore. So she's, well, I'm going to show you with, uh, she, she's supposed to have model here, you know? The, the, the woman with black hair, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, uh, this painting with, uh, you know, the female nude, this is a painting by Basile. So sometimes some experts have ident identified Liz, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But uh, other than Renoir, we don't know. We have no, no testimony, no trace. I've not seen, uh, I mean, it's sure that she has not modeled for uh, Monet. This is sure, not for Manet. Uh, and, and Cicely was doing basically at the time only uh, landscapes. So I would say for Renoir and maybe for Basile. It may be a question of reputation. And as we said before, I mean, she was not a professional model. I mean, she was modeling because Renoir was, was her lover, and maybe she was quite proud to have such, you know, um, a role in, her, in his work, because as I mentioned, I mean, she modeled for very, very important works. I mean, it's not like if she were modeling for, you know, small sketches that stayed in the studio. It was, I mean, she was really on public view from the, the mid-1860s up to the early uh, 1870s. I mean, she was really, you know, uh, exhibited in a way, I mean, showed in uh, the Paris Salon, so she may have been quite proud, even if um, uh, models, uh, they didn't have uh, a very uh, respectable uh, reputation, but in the artistic milieu, it was a bit different. I mean, maybe she enjoyed being, you know, like Camille Doncieux, having this uh, central role uh, in, in the art of her lover. So this is my interpretation. But she was not a professional uh, model, so that's why maybe she was uh, really uh, doing this only for, uh, for Renoir. Do we know if um, the two sons of Renoir knew about Jeanne? Alors, we, we know, they, we, we, we think they knew, we, we know they knew, even if they never, never mentioned Jeanne, 
because uh, Jeanne was on Renoir's testimony. Uh, he gave her uh, some money uh, and it was written on the testimony and so the sons must have seen obviously the testimony. What we know, I don't, have the fi I don't remember the figures, the numbers, but what we do know is that uh, Jean Renoir, Pierre Renoir and Claude Renoir, the three um, uh, sons who later became quite famous, um, they received a huge amount of money. They received uh, um, hundreds of paintings by their fathers so that they were able to live without working, basically. Uh, so they used uh, the money and the paintings. They sold their collection very quickly. And they used it for uh, Jean Renoir uh, made his first films Thanks to this money, uh, we know that uh, Pierre Renoir, who was a, a great theater uh, actor, uh, he was able to support, uh, uh, you know, theaters he liked uh, in Paris. But we do know that Jeanne uh, received a very small and modest amount of money, and she has a very, she had a very, very modest life in. Uh, in Normandy. I mean, she was really the provincial half-sister and she, she never attended any vernissage, any opening, any exhibitions. I mean, she was really hidden. So we know that the sons were, sons were aware of her, but we have no trace of uh, relationship, well, relationships between her. I mean, Renoir was in touch with her uh, curiously uh, through his, uh, one of his dealers, Ambroise Vollard, um, and through uh, two um, uh, housekeepers, Gabriel, who was one also of his uh, favorite models uh, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, and another model uh, and housekeeper, I mean, in, in Renoir's life it was very much uh, uh, linked, uh, La Boulangère. So these were the three people who were taking care of uh, Jeanne and who were uh, who knew how to reach her, etc. But the sons, I mean, they knew about the, the fact that she, they had a sister, but they, we, we, we have no trace. And what is interesting is that uh, Jean Renoir, the film director, wrote a wonderful book on his father in 1862, and he completely, completely, he never, never mentioned Jeanne, and he never mentioned Lise. I mean, this is a, there is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, silence uh, over this period. This is why she has been so uh, overlooked. I mean, we have to wait the 1950s and then more recently, um, uh, uh, recent scholar, uh, scholarship. Otherwise, I mean, she was not very well known. I mean, we knew that she was Lee, that she was Renoir's mistress, but we didn't know really who she was. Hmm. This is so, such an intriguing story. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Zer. Merci.